Welcome back to The Mining Pod. We're down south recording in Miami for Bitcoin 2023. Today, we're joined by Lee Bratcher, president of the Texas Blockchain Council. We discuss Texas mining, Bitcoin, and CBDC bills, domestic ASIC production, and garnering public interest in Bitcoin. Lee, welcome to the Mining Pod. First one in person. I don't know. Might have been on the show two years ago, but I can't remember. That's right. Yeah. Two years ago, but it was virtual. But thanks for having us on, Will. Yeah, I appreciate the time. Uh, there's been a lot going on in Texas. And as we were talking before the show, we have like a handful of Senate bills, a handful of House bills to go through. They're all on different topics, uh, but they're all important in different ways. So we should probably just kind of go through them. And then there's some other things we want to talk about as well, like domestic ASIC production, lobbying, and outreach efforts in the United States, uh, Texas Blockchain Council. You guys have a huge Bitcoin mining focus, but you are in almost everything, whether it be CBDCs to uh, exchange reserves, as we saw today, to Bitcoin mining, Flare Energy. So a lot to cover. Let's start off with the proof of reserves thing, since that was today. You had a great video that just came out on Twitter. Texas, this House Bill 1666, for those who are listening, essentially sets up a standard for how proof of reserve should work for exchanges in Texas. That's right. Yeah, it is a bill that would require exchanges to provide these attestations to the Texas Department of Banking in order to uh, maintain their money transmission license. Uh, it's not a perfect solution. Uh, anybody that's deep in the weeds on proof of reserves and liabilities will tell you that it is a tool in the tool belt of regulators uh, and for added transparency, but we, we still need other frameworks um, to prevent widespread fraud. But it, this is sort of an industry-derived best practice to get that kind of transparency that we need to uh, prevent those kinds of collapses like we saw uh, nine months ago. Okay, I'm going to spit some questions at you that are completely ignorant and uneducated, but you have to deal with it because you're here. Uh, tell me a little bit about like why it matters for just like a state to do this because like these exchanges are international. Like We can't even get them to abide by U.S. law so how can we get, expect them to abide by Texas law? Is this only for Texas-based companies, like an unchained capital, or is this going to be for like even a Binance has to like integrate into this if they want to operate in Texas? That is a great question. So it does apply to all exchanges that do business in Texas. So what we think, Texas is such a large market, we think will happen is these exchanges are going to have to comply because they can't leave the Texas market, right? It's a huge digital asset market. They all want to be here. They all want money transmission licenses. So if they are, if that is true, then they're complying for the state of Texas and therefore their compliance cost for the other states goes to negligible. So if they're already spending the money to comply for Texas, then why would they not comply for the other 49 states? That's similar to what California does with emission standards. While I may or may not be a fan of what California does, uh, the point is still that all these car manufacturers, it's such a big market that they have to comply to that level. It makes no sense for them to, to have different standards for different states. So if a big state with a large market presents a regulatory hurdle, then there's very little extra compliance cost for them to comply with the other 49 states. You just lost half the audience when you said California and emissions in the same sentence. I know. Well, I said, to... I said that I was against it, so hopefully that brought them back. It's too late. They already they, they clicked out. Okay, uh, so that's, that is huge in the wake of FTX for states to be able to do that. Uh, it sounds similar to the bit license in that they want to like bring everyone into one regulatory group, but... Hopefully, it's a little bit better than the bit license, which was obviously like a very different sort of like product, but a similar idea. Like we want to like wrangle this market before it explodes. Yeah, I think well, the exchanges will look at it as um, a compliance cost for sure, but it'll be much more manageable than the bit license. The bit license is cost prohibitive as far as the amount of compliance officers and attorneys and uh, the time. This is very easy. Um, low compliance costs, working with a group that can provide attestations to provide a, a report to the Texas Department of Banking. So it's a it's a, a, a regulatory framework that we're going to call a light touch regulatory framework that gives us more transparency without making it cost prohibitive for the exchange. So we think that the exchanges will be more interested in gaining that trust, that public trust back 
because the opportunity cost of losing the public trust is far greater than the negligible compliance costs of, of complying with the legislation. Gotcha. And speaking of uh, public trust, let's talk about CBDCs. So my understanding, there's a few House bills, Senate bills sort of floating around. Uh, and there's a lot of Republicans that are interested in CBDCs in Texas. And as you mentioned before, we started recording, like banning them. Like they're not interested in enacting them, but they don't want to Texas anymore. And Texas did just pass some legislation around that, if I'm not mistaken. I feel like there's like a new Texas. <laughs> like you guys are passing things so quickly right now, it's hard to keep track of it. But give me the lay of land on the CBDC versus Bitcoin camp in Texas and how these legislators are seeing these two different instruments. Yeah, the Texas session is brief. It's six months every two years. So you are going to see rapid fire over the next couple of weeks. A lot of these bills come out and then you'll you'll hear silence for a while. So that's the reason for that. The Senate Concurrent Resolution 25, sponsored by Senator Tan Parker, is a resolution that expresses Texas opposition to central bank digital currencies. We at the Texas Blockchain Council helped uh, uh, to craft that narrative with our legislators and they were very receptive because they believe in liberty, they believe in privacy, uh, they understand the threat that a CBDC uh, exhibits. And so it was really uh, just a partnership with them because w their worldview is aligned. And um, we did have to do a little bit of educating uh, around Bitcoin. And this gets into Senate Bill 1751, which uh, I'm sure you also want to talk about. That is the bill that would prevent miners from taking advantage of ancillary services within ERCOT. So we had to do a little educating around Bitcoin being the antithesis of a CBDC. There were some legislators that are very anti-CBDC, but then they were also a little bit anti-Bitcoin because they thought they were similar rather than the complete opposites. So there was some education that was involved there. Uh, we know for a fact that CBDCs will never be a winning issue in Texas. And so that's an area that we found a lot of political support, grassroots support. Um, and what we're really working to try to do is help them go one step further and realize Bitcoin mining is a defense against CBDCs because it presents a viable alternative along with privately issued stable coins uh, and physical cash to a CBDC. Those things are all, they're not, those, the three of those are not competing with each other. Those are all three viable alternatives to a CBDC and we need all of them. We need physical cash. We need private sector CB, uh, private sector stable coins and we need uh, Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining. And you can't have Bitcoin without Bitcoin mining. So that's a little bit more nuanced, but that's the narrative that we're working to put forward with the elected officials in Texas. It's funny that some of the gaps, like we think, because we're just in the industry, we think like people will get the, the CBDC stuff versus the Bitcoin stuff. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. See outreach efforts is mostly comes down to saying the same thing over and over again. And then you kind of feel like you're not really helping anyone out, but you are because there's a lot of new entrants in the industry every day. Well, let's go back to 1751 though. Uh, limiting demand response. My understanding is that hasn't gone anywhere in a little bit. So it passed the House and the Senate, right? But it's likely to be vetoed. And can you like define it? And Absolutely. And correct me. Yeah. So Senate. it did pass the Senate, but not the House. Okay. It is a bill that does three, three, three things. One is it requires all large loads over 10 megawatts to register with ERCOT. We are supportive of that. And the industry writ large is supportive of that. There's another bill that will pass, Senate Bill 1929, that requires all large loads over 29, or excuse me, over 75 megawatts to register. That bill uh, will likely pass, and we support it. We want as much communication between ERCOT and large flexible load operators like green hydrogen and Bitcoin miners as possible. So that's one component of the bill. The other component would strip away Chapter 312 tax benefits. That's the local uh, tax benefit for uh, creating new jobs in a jurisdiction. And uh, that just seems arbitrary and unfair. Why would you pull that away from a Bitcoin miner when uh, you could, any other industry could get that? So the bill's author, Senator Cole, of course, has, has admitted that and kind of come off that point and been willing to, to, to remove that from the bill. It, she's really not had a chance to remove it, though, because it's effectively dead in the House. We are remaining vigilant until the end of the session, though, to make sure that it stays dead. But it has not gotten a hearing in the House. And at this point in the session, that means it's effectively dead. Uh, it could still crop up. You know, some of those concepts could still crop up in other legislation. So that's why we're remaining vigilant until May 29th, the last day of the session. But the last thing 
that is most of interest to the audience is the limitation of Bitcoin miners in ancillary services. Mo most people know that as demand response. So it, it limits Bitcoin miners to 10% of all ancillary services that were purchased in the day ahead market. Uh, right now, Bitcoin miners participate in a wide ranging of, it depends on the day, Bitcoin miners could be at 5% or 25% of ancillaries. We're definitely a growing share, but day by day, that number fluctuates. Uh, it may not fluctuate in that large of a range that I just described, but it is a significant curtailment to prevent them to just 10%. And so that's what we're really fighting the hardest. And we brought Brad Jones on retainer at the TBC. He is the former ERCOT CEO. He is now just a private citizen, but incredibly brilliant when it comes to um, the ERCOT deregulated marketplace. So we brought him on retainer. And we were able to go throughout the capital, educate staffers and members uh, with him, describing his perspective. And he says it in a very folksy way, a very uh, just, you know, no nonsense way. He says, guys, if you're going to have all these miners here, the last thing you want to do is limit their effectiveness for the grid and for the people of Texas. Because what miners do are bidding, they're bidding down the price at which um, these services are procured by ERCOT. So if you remove miners, you're removing bids and therefore the price, the other bidders will be able to bid higher and, and be able to secure those contracts. Now we do know that there was an industry group that suggested this legislation and they said, well, we don't want Bitcoin miners to take up too high or too large of a share of ancillaries. What that means to me is Bitcoin miners are out competing us and they're outbidding us in the day ahead. And we used to extract all this value from ERCOT because we're a le legacy industry, but we can't anymore. So now we're going to try for some regulatory capture. And that was admitted to me by a staffer that said, Hey, there was another group an, a lobbying group from another industry that is very concerned at how effective Bitcoin miners are and how quick they are to respond. And so that told me a couple of things. A, they're going to play the game and we're going to, you know, play it right back. And two, we're doing something right. Any guesses on who that was? We have lots of guesses. Uh, could have been generators, could have been AICT, could have been um, large petrochemical, you know, refineries on the coast. Anybody who is playing in the demand response market that used to extract more value than they do now. So there's, there's a couple of different groups. Uh, even generators do play in that mm -hmm. as well, as well as loads. So it could be a, a load or a generator. Do you think there's a peaceful resolution to that if that keeps going or just because the competition is going to be more behind the scenes action? I think they're going to, once this bill dies, they're going to realize, okay, we just have to compete yeah. and we can't tilt the playing field in our favor, which what they were hoping to do with this. And what I think ERCOT's going to realize is there is no load like a Bitcoin mining load. Um, it, we, should, we should really be call, calling it energy arbitrage and monetizing energy optionality rather than Bitcoin mining, because in the next few years, that will be more of the story than how much you, you know, what price per tera hash you bought your ASICs at. It's how well are you monetizing your energy optionality? Because the margins have gone from crazy great in the last couple of years to, and then there's ebbs and flows, right, with the market and the hash price. But recently, that's compressed significantly. And I think there could be swings in the future. There will be. People are waiting to catch that that hash price, you know, spike when when Bitcoin rips. But those, just like Bitcoin's volatility is going like this, hash price volatility is going to do the same thing. So, power power markets and playing in the power markets is going to play an ever increasing role in Bitcoin mining of the future. Mm -hmm. Whereas five years ago, it was like I don't care. I'm mining at three cents or five cents. It doesn't matter because we got crazy margins right now. But in the future, it's going to be like, all right, well, I'm doing, I've got a, a wholesale rate of, of X, but I'm, you know, I'm, my net price is Y because I'm, I'm in, I'm in 4CP, I'm uh, curtailing, I've got a hedged uh, power price that I'm selling back occasionally. So my, my net power price is, is significantly lower. That's, that's the name of the game. That's a really interesting and important point you just made. <clears throat> so I want to stick with it for a second and maybe like land the plane. Riot made a lot of headlines last summer where they had like 10 million in energy credits because they just turned it off in the summer and they already had like the power agreements in place. So they just got paid to just not use the energy from the grid and they got paid in credits, uh, which I think they use against like future payments. 
but from what which you, is essentially the same as cash for them yeah so it's the same thing yeah. so just like abstracting a little bit more i i'm seeing a world where there's like stranded energy miners who are just like picking up hash price for really cheap because they have really low cost of energy and then these texas miners who are not even mining anymore they're just you know they're they're technically mining but they're really just playing the energy arbitrage game is that how you're kind of seeing things develop yeah I think that's why you see Marathon going uh, to the Middle East like they're they're doing. They're they're chasing low cost energy over there. The stranded gas miners are not scaling to the point where they can make a huge difference, but they are very sustainable uh, at like you know equivalent of one cent a kilowatt hour based upon where they're getting this this gas at like less than a dollar an MCF. So it, it may not be like the big splashy play in the near term, but you can't beat that as far as power price. And then the, the on-grid miners that are effective at their power management and monetizing their energy optionality will outcompete everybody else every day of the week. It's wild. Yeah, I heard one miner say, like, if you are operating in Texas on a large scale and you have an energy trader in Dallas in an AC room with a bunch of screens, then you are going to be done because you cannot trade fast enough. I would say the same is true for Ohio. Um, because PJM is enough, you know, there's some similarities that you need that in Ohio as well. Uh, it's only like the North Dakotas of the world that that may be a little less relevant. Okay. Well, we'll have to talk afterwards to give you some context for up there because uh, I know like two Ohio miners, but we'll talk about that later. I want to go back to something you said earlier about uh, this one person on the 1751 bill that you were able to talk to and sort of change their opinion on it. That seems to be very different on the state level than the national level, being able to change a politician's opinion. Has that sort of been the case, or is that just one instance where someone was able to like look at the facts and change their opinion? I think what we find with elected officials is they just don't have enough time to spend like we have. So we have to attach this to something that they're already familiar with. And so the argument that Bitcoin is the antithesis or the other side of the coin to a CBDC is a really helpful narrative because they already know in like with with reflex that they are against CBDC. So for example, we're in a, a elected official's office, a very high ranking Texas elected official. We're talking about 1751 and he says, "I don't really know much about this." This is this is actually his staffer and so her comment actually was, "I don't really know much about 1751, but I know that we're against CBDCs. We didn't go in there to talk about CBDCs. We we went in there to talk about Bitcoin mining." And so she said, how do you, how do we craft narratives that demonstrate that we are, you know, spun up on this issue and that we're clearly against it? And so it clicked for us then, my colleague Steve Kennard was there in the room with me, and it clicked for us that drawing this distinction is going to be a clear, just like the Chad Harris's of the world who do the, uh, did the jobs uh, stick. That's like every time he got on a mic, he talked about jobs because politicians can connect with that tax revenue, jobs, rural economic yeah. development, all that. So from a philosophical perspective, this CBDC thing is actually really helpful for Bitcoin mining because we can not, we can stop fighting the whole energy FUD. We can just start putting, uh, putting us on the other side of the table of CBDCs, which is in reality what we are, but that's been an underplayed component to things, but that has resonated, you know, presidential candidate Ron DeSantis talking about CBDCs on a regular basis. Now, never mind that the Florida law was is a little bit incoherent and you can't as a state ban CBDCs, that's okay. His political instincts were correct. So we can use those political instincts uh, and it doesn't matter if they're Republican or Democrat. There's a lot of Democrats that are anti-CBDC too. So I, I think that's really another point in addition to the jobs tax revenue narrative that we really need to be talking about. Um, that resonated incredibly quickly with elected officials. And that's, you're, you're latching onto something that they already understand. And then you're saying, yeah, Bitcoin mining is just the, the antithesis, antithesis of CBDCs. Hmm. I didn't think about that. It's like shitcoin saving Bitcoin somehow in this, this weird instance. Um, any thoughts on the New York Times piece? This is like two months old now, but I'm, I'm curious to that. Does any mainstream stuff like that ever like have a landing place when it comes to like the work you guys are doing? Does that like infiltrate the halls of certain places and you guys have to like talk to staffers about it or like beat down that FUD? Absolutely. Yep. They read that stuff. Yeah. It's unfortunate. We are, we are really excited about some initiatives coming out of Texas A&M 
for greater data and more transparency because the data that the the author of the New York Times piece uh, gave is his name. It, they they were using like a black box. Nobody can fact check it. You can't. It, it's it's uh, impossible to uh, to fact check. So what we need is transparent data from a respected institution that understands power markets and grids. And Texas A and M has been doing research for ERCOT for decades. So this partnership between Texas A and M, the Texas Blockchain Council, and Texas miners with Riot taking the lead on that. Uh, but many miners are getting involved. Marathon's getting involved. Cypher's getting involved. Uh, I'm sure after this podcast, we'll get a bunch of emails of other miners that are going to get involved. This partnership is incredibly interesting because we're going to have actionable data from an institution that's globally recognized that has all the back-end ERCOT data. I mean, ERCOT contracts with A&M to do most of their market research. Yeah. Uh, and their grid reliability research, and uh, they have like synthetic grids, ERCOT grids that they, that they run that are that are just like notional synthetic grids. Oh, cool. So this is going to take time, but when you can counter the Cambridge data and the you know New York Times data with the kind of carbon accounting that they used for that, which was entirely unfair, but it served their narrative, so they had some motivated reasoning to use that, then. I think we'll be in a better position to push back because right now we're just putting pushing back with like anecdotal facts and logic and things that don't have as much of a, a ring in the media. They're not as sound biteable, if you will. Yeah. And you know, we, we all get exhausted from doing it. We're going to continue to do it until we have uh, other kinds of data to push back with. Two questions on that. First one, privacy and Bitcoin mining. So a lot of Bitcoin miners don't want to share anything about their operation. I mean, even before I mean, 2021, mining in the US was very small, like as a global footprint, and most miners would, like, such a small community. That changed after the China ban, and people have been much more open, and with like the rise of 20 plus public companies, a lot of this data is now public. But I imagine there's like a hey, decent amount of people in Texas and in the US who do not want to share their data. Yeah. So how do you guys go about getting those guys to share, or is it just going to be like, ERCOT has the data, so, so be it. Yeah, so the TBC do doesn't actually house a lot of data internally. We do have quite a bit of data about mining uh, capacity in Texas, and we keep that on a confidential document that, that resides, you know, almost like in a hardware wallet, if you will, but it's just in, in a, hard in a uh, hardware device that's just not connected to the internet. So we have this, this data about the miners that we can aggregate and anonymize, to be able to get large scale statistics. Now we don't have nuanced data and we would never ask for that from the miners. What we would say is, hey, ERCOT has this data on your load. They will aggregate and anonymize it and give it to A&M. And A&M respects, first of all, A&M won't know who is who. They could probably figure it out based upon geography and different things. But A&M deals with like research contracts from massive Fortune 500 companies. so. I'm pretty sure that the miners are going to be comfortable with with A and M having like incredibly nuanced data about them that ERCOT already has. ERCOT's very again, they're very confidential as well. Uh, but you have two institutions like ERCOT and A and M that really are the only ones that have the you know uh, granular data. I think people are going to be comfortable with that. Okay, okay. My my one feeling is like there's like this obviously very large privacy camp in Bitcoin. And that can bleed through into mining stuff. And yeah. then there's also like the conversation that Nick Carter and a lot of other people have pushed that they're politicizing the use of energy. And so if any sort of database exists, then that can be politicized in some future time. It doesn't have to be now. So that was actually one reason when the Bitcoin Mining Council came out and started like pushing some of its data. I was a little hesitant hmm. and wasn't super in favor of some of it because it's like, uh, sometimes this data, like, it can be useful as a dashboard and as a sending board and to push back on journalist narratives, but it can also be pretty dangerous. Um, but that's supposing that we don't collect that information for other industries, which I actually don't have any knowledge about. seems like they do on a lot of scales. Yeah, and I think it's just a matter of, I, I think there'll be some miners that perhaps aren't comfortable sharing that with with uh, researchers at Texas A&M, and that's totally fine. You know, there, there, are, there is a point at which it doesn't really matter, because if there are a, a certain scale, like if they're a 10 megawatt miner, then it doesn't matter, yeah. right? The ERCOT probably isn't even noticing that. In fact, yeah. they haven't even tagged them as a Bitcoin miner probably. Yeah. Uh, but if you are of a certain scale, 
and it looks like it's going to be 75 megawatts or greater, or if you are a publicly traded company and you're just going to voluntarily yeah. put that information forward, maybe you have like 10 sites and they're all 40 megawatts, yeah. um, but you're, you're traded publicly traded, then that data is already out there anyways. Yeah. So I think for the private miners that are 75 megawatts and greater, they might as well share it with AM because ERCOT's already got it, which means AM's got it in, in an anonymized way, yeah. right? And totally anonymized and confidential, but you might as well share it anyways. Gotcha. Uh, now, there, again, there's exceptions, and someone who's smaller could make their own decision. Um, but, and I think that's that's the free market. The the miners can make a decision. You know, do I want to be part of this yeah. research initiative and benefit from it, or do I? is it more valuable to me to remain completely off the grid if, if you know what, not like yeah. literally off the grid, but just under the radar. Yeah. I, I can already think of like a, a few names of miners I know who would be, give this whole idea the middle finger. Um, and and that's the beauty of it. We <laughs> They're welcome to do that and they'll still benefit from everybody else coming together and doing the right thing. Gotcha. Okay. Same topic, New York Times article. Uh, I, I saw you kind of come up after on Twitter, um, after this article came out, even before this article came out, sort of being like, hey, let's respect this journalist's profession. Let's do a good job of interacting with him. A lot of Bitcoin miners didn't listen to you. Or maybe Twitter just didn't show you, uh, show them your feed. I wasn't overly impressed with some of the reaction. I wasn't impressed with the article either, but I think it was like a good learning point for a lot of people to like learn how to interact with the journalists and how to interact with New York Times. And this is only going to happen. Yeah. More often. What was your takeaway from that? And what would be some like encouragements or some like strategies from a policy interaction standpoint with, with journalists or even state representatives, local community leaders? Yeah. It, it's, it's, what is the Dale Carnegie, right? How to win friends and influence people. We sort of operate under that uh, thesis. And so when you make a, a someone who's leaning towards an enemy and solidify him or her in that position of you know great animosity um they're incredibly difficult to overcome even if they're just a thorn in your side so with gabe um nice guy he came to our summit he did a lot of research when i when i saw that he was doing this like marginal carbon accounting stuff i thought oh this is going to be a bloodbath this is i know he's got motivated reasoning on this uh it's unfortunate but at least, you know, we still need to respect someone who we have a difference of opinion with. And so we had, we've had long conversations on the phone. He unfortunately didn't use the quote that I wanted to, him to use from me, even though he said he might, uh, he just used, uh, some generic quote from me in the article. And, but really what caused me to send that tweet in particular that you're talking about, Will, was he called me up, uh, a week or so before the article hit and he said, Hey, I've been getting death threats in my DMS. So I had to turn them off. I had to turn my DMs off. Uh, now that's probably slightly exaggerated, but maybe not, you know, there's a little bit of truth in everything and there's three sides of every story, right? Yeah. So the truth might've been somewhere in between, but someone was threatening violence against him, which again, who knows if it was credible or not, but it was enough for him to like call me up and, and mention that. And so I just think that we can do so much more as an industry to uh, greater, bring a greater level of professionalism yeah. than, than the, the kind of Twitter back and forth that is really not helping us. It's, it's a perverse incentive on Twitter though, because those people get fueled by the Twitter algorithm. Yeah. Um, and that maybe that's their brand. Uh, and maybe they just got spun up and they got really frustrated and there's other things going on and they shot off a DM to this guy, but that's the kind of thing that, uh, makes an enemy for life. Yeah. Uh, I'd be pissed. Uh, I would not be, yeah, I would not want to interact with this, with this community if that, that's what was going on. Um, there's a perverse thing about Bitcoin Twitter and crypto Twitter in general though, cause it's all money and influence and then making more money off the top of that. Okay. We're going to change gears and then actually come back to the, the lobbying outreach efforts. But before we do that, I want to talk about two things first. And that is what's going on with ERCOT and PUC bills. <laughs> and then also domestic ASIC production. Let's start with the ERCOT thing really quickly. I have sort of just shot it into the moon and decided not to pay attention to it until something happens because there's like so much going on. There's so much back and forth. The last time I touched it was December and it looked like there was like this new market structure they were thinking about implementing in Texas uh, with some sort of like power credit scheme. 
it was going back and forth. Things didn't seem like it landed. At the end of the day, though, there's a lot of politicians who do want to see ERCOT move in a different direction. And I would assume that miners, well, they, they necessarily have to care because it's going to be their energy bill, but they might not like what the final decision is. So it, as much as is possible in the chaos that is happening right now in, in Austin, can you give an overview of what's happening with ERCOT and PUC in the governor's office and what you are expecting this to look like? Yeah. So with a disclaimer that it's changing every day and by the time this airs, this might be old information, but yeah, there was a performance credit mechanism structure that was posited by the, the PUC of Texas and the Senate, the Texas Senate came out very hard against that. And they've, there's Senate Bill 6 and Senate Bill 7 and different things that they're trying to do to um, incentivize more firm generation, more, it's really incentivizing natural gas generation. They're not saying that, but that's the way that it's structured. It's incentivizing natural gas generation for more base generation that, uh, because Texas has such high renewables penetration, we either have to have a lot more Bitcoin mining or a lot more natural gas generation, um, because the variability from wind and solar is just too much for any grid. To, to cope with. So that's the Senate's perspective. The House's perspective is a little bit more nuanced. They don't agree. That's why your your strategy was a, a good one to not really try to wrap your mind around this too much because we still don't know what's going to emerge. And there's probably going to be a special legislative session called by the governor to deal with this because it's likely that they won't solve this, this um, chasm between the House proposals and the Senate proposals. Um, who knows what it's going to look like. It's probably not going to be a performance credit, credit mechanism. It could be some combination of a little bit of a market redesign, which is the PCM and a little bit of a, um, a subsidy for natural gas generators. That's my best guess of what it looks like. And, uh, I think in both cases, it's unfortunate for Bitcoin miners because Bitcoin miners can serve as that tool to uh, eliminate some of that variability, but it's really negligible in, in, in the end, because Bitcoin miners are flex and sec, flexible enough to really avoid most of the PCM charges anyways, because they would get credited for their flexibility. So just like they do with 4CP management, that's for, uh, that's the four months over the summer where they are curtailing on the highest usage day of that month, uh, from June to September. It would be similar to that in a sense, but it would a little bit, look a little bit differently, It'd be built for like a winter, uh, winter peaks as well. And so they would be managing their power to enhance the number of credits they got as a, as a load. Again, that's probably out the window. There'll probably be some sort of compromise between the house and the Senate on the, the natural gas subsidies, whether that's, you know, cheap credit for natural gas generators or, um, actually the state owning some generation assets, which is crazy to me that that's even an idea in Texas. Um, it's a really bad one, but we, you know, we, we support the Senate's efforts to increase reliability. I just don't think that's the best way to do it. Uh, so all that being said, the Bitcoin miners are far more interested in S Senate bill 1751, because that affects their bottom line in a very real way. This other stuff certainly does affect future, you know, the, the, the way the market functions, which is incredibly important, but because of the flexibility of Bitcoin miners, whichever way that they structure this, as long as it doesn't do, do away with the deregulated energy only marketplace, Bitcoin miners will be well positioned to take advantage of it. So, uh, we are observing it, watching it, fascinated by it, but not worried about it. Okay. That's good. And I'm glad to hear that the attaboy that I'm not paying attention to it and it doesn't matter yet. So I will be, I'll pay attention when I see something on your, on your Twitter feed. Okay. Let's go to domestic ASIC production. There's a gap right now in ASIC production. It's like got the big three, but it's really just Bitmain and what's minor. Like Canaan sort of making some inroads in the U S again and we're North America. Epic blockchain has started selling more actively and they're out of Toronto and there's some other companies uh, that I've heard of as well. But it does seem like with the Taiwan stuff and China, there's a there's a gap. So what are you thinking about it and other miners that you're interacting with? How do they see ASIC production? Yeah, I think it's one of the largest challenges facing the industry is 
the geopolitical risk of having only Ch Chinese suppliers for Bitcoin mining ASICs, especially related to critical infrastructure. Texas just passed the Texas Chips Act. Uh, of course, we have the Federal Chips Act. And so there's a lot of incentives right now from both the federal and state government. And I'm sure other states, I know Arizona's handing out incentives like crazy to uh, TSMC and Samsung. So the geopolitical risk is not being baked in to anybody's calculation yet. And, uh, or, or if it is, it's an underappreciated factor. And I think some kind of viable domestic ASIC supplier is, is inevitable, if only to mitigate that risk. Now, I, I do think that with the combination of talent, where the mining is actually taking place, that people are actually utilizing this, these machines, the level of disconnect and pain points that we see between Bitmain and the, the American market is is significant and so they if i were bitman i would not be responsive to my customers either because i have a basically a monopoly or a duopoly if you include micro bt so it, it's certainly within there I mean, it makes sense that they would want to do that and, and act in that way but we can't continue down this road and so my my thesis is that there will be credible american manufacturers that uh partner with companies that have incredible ASIC designs that are looped in with TSMC. And so I do think that we will see a lot in the next year on the domestic ASIC manufacturing front. Uh, it doesn't have to necessarily compete on price right now because Bitmain could just dump hundreds of thousands of machines on the market at any, at any time and, and tank the price even lower. Because they have those production schedules that they have to meet with TSMC, they're still making machines even in, in this market. And they're making them in a scale that doesn't necessarily make sense. Something's gonna, something's gotta happen. And I think breaking the paradigm of the shoebox mm -hmm. uh, machine is also sort of an, another iteration in uh, ASIC, the, the history of ASICs, if you will. Yeah, uh, we've we've got to look towards a more traditional bladed design in in uh, either either water or immersion. Yeah, dielectric fluid. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. Hopefully someone comes out. I mean, the stuff with Block seems to be going pretty well. They just bought a bunch of chips off Intel, um, even though Intel's wrapping their stuff down. And then Epic, as I mentioned, is starting to sell more and they're based out of Toronto. So it seems like there's some competitors coming up in the wings. Yep. Last topic for today. We've mentioned it three times already, lobbying and outreach efforts. Um, but yeah, before we started the show, we're kind of talking about how oftentimes Bitcoin mining right now and outreach efforts, you're typically fishing out of the same pond and like it's good that those fish are there because you want them to be engaged and informed but bringing people in it really depends on the price and you see an influx of people who are interested in the space every four years uh for a lowly podcast it's not too big of a deal but for someone who is actively helping to shape and inform public policy it's paramount that you get people who are interested and capable of taking action on top of that interest uh, so from the TBC's perspective, what are some things that you guys are doing that's like succeeding? And what are some things that you guys are looking to do to ramp up interest? And, and lastly, how can people get more involved with what you guys are doing and uh, help you guys out? Yeah, it's a classic collective action problem, right? Everybody wants to see other people exert time and energy on things that help the industry as a whole. So what we're having to do is with, we're a nonprofit industry association, so a 501c6, which means we're not a charity, we're not tax deductible, we run like a, a chamber of commerce. So we have to have a business model where it makes sense for companies to participate, to, to pay membership dues. They have to get value out of that. It can't be just purely altruistic. Uh, so we have to provide value either, either from a business development front, which is a lot of the vendors and suppliers and, and things like that, connecting with law firms, you know, tax audit, private equity, family office, all that stuff. But then really our bread and butter, butter is also the regulatory thing. So a lot of the Bitcoin miners would not spend the time of day. They don't need help getting in touch with people that want to sell them stuff. Those people are already at their front door. Now, those people want to be a part of the TBC for sure, but the miners main headache is regulatory risk. And so that we have to be really good at that for them to want to um, continue to support our efforts. So that's on the corporate level. On the grassroots level, we we make ourselves really good at lobbying and um, advocacy 
and politics by having a good grassroots base as well. So you have to do both. You can't just be this silent corporate, yeah, you know, entity. You have to have a grassroots effort because that's what politicians. <laughs> they uh, are three things give groups influence in politics. It's money, it's numbers, as in numbers of people, or it's the the um, amount of passion that those people have. So like yeah. Mothers Against Drunk Driving, they don't have a lot of money or numbers, but they're very passionate. The NRA, the NRA is like the closest group that comes to having a little bit of all three. Yeah. Where I would say at the, in the Bitcoin mining space, we, we are working in all three of those categories. Uh, and because of the market, we're down on the, you know, we don't have a lot of money sloshing around for every four years. We have a lot of money. Yeah. Every four years we get a lot of money, but right now we're working on numbers and passion. And so that's where the gra grassroots advocacy comes in. We've got to build out different groups within different cities. Uh, it gets real local real fast. All politics is local, right? So it gets local real fast. We have communities in different cities throughout the state of Texas. And then even our you know, influence is growing into other states. We have great partnerships with other state associations like the Ohio Blockchain Council and U.S. Blockchain Coalition, which is 40 different state associations. Um, so we, we, we're spreading our tentacles locally in order to influence policy nationally. And so even just building those meetups, building those, those email distros down to the city level, uh, knowing city council people, knowing county judges, uh, that really helps you aggregate your influence when it comes time to trying to talk to politicians at a, at a much higher level. Okay. How do you feel about like Texans being interested in the topic right now? Is it has it waned a lot since last year or is it still like pretty competitive and people are spamming your email and yeah no it's definitely have plenty of twitter impersonators but it is waned a bit uh so we are working off of the people that are here are the people that want to be here right there's a lot of people especially at the grassroots level that are just giving their time and effort and that's really fun to see because that's how the TBC started, was just a volunteer effort, and we've grown it into a business, but um, you can't operate at the level that we operate and still be a volunteer effort. So there are a lot of people in the grassroots that are passionate about this. Growing the ranks is something that we need to do what, regardless of the market. It's harder right now, but uh, that doesn't make it any less important. So you know, we're gonna restart our meetups pretty soon. Uh, we, we took a break for the legislative session because that was our sole focus was policy for the last five months. So we haven't really done very many meetups the last couple of months. We're going to start up meetups again soon, partnering with different companies in the space. We want the meetups because we want to build the coalition, right? Of voters, of interested persons, of institutions, even. Yeah. The partnering companies want them for other reasons. And that's great. There's a very symbiotic uh, relationship there with the TBC and our member companies, and even just non-corporate members that are partnering with us on these things. So getting getting uh, people to sign on to petitions, having rallies, just capturing more passionate people yeah. and effectively communicating to them uh, is a thankless task, but it's one that we've been building out for, for years now. And we're excited to uh, be able to deploy the, the energy and the um, expertise of that, of that uh, cohort. I'm not gonna call it an army, um, so but yeah, this brings up too much of Elizabeth Warren, like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, anti-crypto army yeah. craziness uh, but but the energy and expertise that those people have we're going to unleash them mm -hmm. at the right time and at the right places it's not on Twitter sometimes it is on Twitter actually yeah. but we want it targeted we want it thought through we don't want it just disparate efforts so, we, so we've got to really point that cannon in the right direction that's a, probably a terrible analogy but point that those efforts in the right direction yeah. give them the tools that they need the information, the, num the no numbers to call, the, the emails to email, uh, the meetings to have, the talking points, and then let then unleash these passionate, I'll call them colleagues. Bag holders. Yeah, that's what I call them. <laughs> <laughs> Lee, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I'll see you around Miami parties tonight. Yeah, thanks, Will. <laughs> 